Rob Moore with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, June 9th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, John B. Judas, editor at large at Talking Points Memo. On the politics of our time, populism, nationalism, socialism. Also on the program today, Joe Biden ends the bipartisan attempt with Capetto to start a bipartisan attempt with the next Capetto. Meanwhile, Democrats begin to panic over the apparent stalemate in the Senate. Speaking of not stalemated, the Senate passed a $250 billion bill to compete with China's military and manufacturing. Incidentally, 5% of that will subsidize Jeff Bezos's flight into space. White House moves to close Guantanamo Bay. Joe Biden heads to his first overseas trip. We'll meet with Putin. We'll meet with the G7. He's back. Terry McAuliffe wins the Democratic nomination in Virginia for governor. El Salvador becomes the first country to adopt Bitcoin. And the Line 3 pipeline protesters have occupied primary construction site. Meanwhile, the Republicans filibuster a gender pay gap legislation. It's their second filibuster. And the Senate confirms its first two Biden justices. All this and more on today's program. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is the proverbial hump day. Monday, uh, wait, no, Wednesday. Yes. Uh, yep, there it Flubbed is. Flubbed that, huh? I did. Well, I, 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 back in the old days, it used to be Monday. And, uh, and then they shifted it to Wednesday, so. I was not aware of that ancient well, history. Well, I, I've i just been around a little bit longer than, than you have. And That's obvious, yeah, it. yeah. But uh, Emma Viglin is here. Hello, Emma. Hey, Sam, how are you? How's your newfangled hump day going? Uh, it's going fine. I feel like it's been raining in New York, given how warm it is, and yet it has not cooled down, so. Uh, yep. Lots of sweat, especially if you take the subway. So Godspeed for everybody else in in the in New York City right now. There you go. Great to uh, get that update. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, um, let's go to uh, let's check out um, this. We we we've got a, a decent amount of news here, um, uh, which we will get to uh, in the uh, second hour. Uh, I should also add Val Demings uh, launched her campaign officially. Uh, to run against Marco Rubio. And uh, Ro Khanna has introduced a bill which will allow states to uh, essentially carve a path toward Medicare for all. Um, we'll see how that does in the, uh, in the context of, of the House. But the House seems to be uh, getting ready. They're gearing up um, to both deal with the uh, debt ceiling and they're getting a little antsy about reconciliation. Uh, progressives are starting to um, see the writing on the wall that maybe there is not going to be 
or there is more likely than not going to be any type of filibuster reform. So the willingness to negotiate on what ultimately becomes the infrastructure bill uh, is getting narrowed. And of course, we also have problems with the uh, voting rights bills that are in, in play uh, because as the Democrats dawdle, Republicans are passing legislation uh, across the states to make it harder to vote. So this is the dynamic. We'll talk to uh, John Judas about this uh, as well. But um, let's check in. As we know, uh, vaccine rates are have slowed down dramatically. There is um, multiple reasons for this that people speculate. Uh, hard to know exactly. One that was a surprise recently was revealed that uh, through surveys that people think that they're going to be billed for it. Even though it is free, they think there's going to be surprise billing. There's internalized trauma from our for-profit healthcare system. It's, it, it's one of the more depressing things to that we read about um, in, in recent weeks. That, I mean, that's exactly what it is. And it's, uh, I mean, it. I mean, I just contemplate that. That's stunning that we can't even give away the vaccine because people in this country have been so trained to assume that they're going to get charged for it. Yeah, it's like a dog who just it feels like it's going to get kicked every time you approach it. I mean, that's the that's the, the image in my mind when I think about that dynamic. Um, I mean, I, you know, there's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know what lesson you could take from this other than like, you know, when you have health emergencies in the future, um, you need to do a better job of giving or creating confidence in your citizens that your healthcare system works <laughs> and will not leave them out in the cold. And then there's uh, another uh, percentage of people who are just difficult to reach. They may not have the time to take off from work. They may not have the uh, money to have transportation. Um, so there's outreach to those type of people. And then you also have the situation where uh, you have people who are vaccine reluctant. Maybe they just think like, oh, it's gone away. We don't need to worry about that. And then some people who are just absolutely um, have bought in to all of the anti-vax insanity. And I give you Sherry Tenpenny. She is uh, a member of the Ohio House Health Committee. She is a, uh, she works in the Ohio legislature. Uh, she's a, she's a uh, expert witness. Expert witness. Check this out. And some of the information that I think had been discussed on your podcast related to EMF frequencies. That was a thought. And, and it was you, I mean, because now because right now that? we're all kind of um, hypothesizing. I mean, what is it that's actually being transmitted that's causing all of these things? Is it a combination of the protein, which now we're finding has a metal attached to it? I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the Internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick because now we think that there's a metal piece to that. There's been people who've long suspected that there was some sort of an interface, yet to be defined, an interface between what's being injected in these shots and all of the 5G towers. Not proven yet, but if we're trying to figure out what is it that's being transmitted to these unvaccinated people. Right. It's not proven yet, incidentally. Uh, so we should just <clears throat> let you know that, you know, if you, it's not proven that you're getting any transmission from the 5G or that there's any type of magnetization. I'm sorry. Just trying to move my stapler around. Got, wait, uh, wait, what? <laughs> trying to, no, that's all right. Just, uh, wait, wait, what are you I, talking about? Now I got my stapler is a little bit <laughs> stuck in my hand. I'm sorry. I may have to go to that's break. exactly what she's saying. What's that? No, I can't. I mean, I'm fully vaccinated. I don't. Mm, all right. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And there's uh, some truth to this. <laughs> it's pretty subtle. It's subtle with that. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I've noticed the dog stopped barking at me, too. So, yeah, yeah.
And uh little callback. All right. Oh, there we go. There You're we like go. Magneto. What's that? Yeah, no. Um, all right. Well, we'll oh gosh. Now we got a problem with the mic. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back uh with John B. Judas, editor at large, a talking points memo. All right, uh, folks, today's show is sponsored by, if I can uh, get my, uh, um, here we go. Hey, Hunt a, uh, Hunt a Killer is the uh, murder mystery subscription box. That's the most exciting date night you can do at home. I got to tell you, during COVID, uh, this is a, and pre-COVID uh, with my daughter, She's not like she's, uh, she doesn't want to even talk to me anymore. So, uh, but uh, Hunt a Killer was, we had a ton of fun with this. It brings people together by challenging them to decode ciphers, uh, clues, examine clues, you solve puzzles. You're basically weeding through, wading through um, all sorts of evidence. You get documents, you get audio recordings. They, they send you case files, you eliminate suspects. You identify murder weapons. Then, if you're really smart, you crack the case and you catch the killer. It's like an escape room uh, delivered right to your door. You can even grab some wine, hop on Zoom these days, play with a socially distant friend. Great way to reconnect uh, with people, maybe across the country or in person. If you're vaccinated, plus join a Hunter Killer's spoiler-free community. You get thousands of members to help each other solve difficult puzzles and talk about true crime. Hunt a Killer has 100,000 active subscribers and over 2,000 five-star reviews. Also, part of the proceeds for every box goes to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization dedicated to helping with real-life cold cases. Um, Matt, how did it work out? Didn't you and your girlfriend uh, play the theater one? Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, it's like this theater where the owner is like, hey, we have this theater and we want to base maintain it, but there was a murder that went unsolved in the thirties. Uh, could you go sort that out for us? And yeah, it's cool. You could look at like police reports and, you know, I've watched much worse things on Netflix, um, looking for a sort of murder mystery. Um, it's like, it's like you actually get to participate in it. Yep. And, uh, the stories are, are really worked out. We did, my daughter and I did that, thir uh, that, um, uh, uh, 1930s, um, uh, theater one, which was a great way to sort of just like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if everybody has these type of experiences when they do that, but it was a good way for me to sort of like inject history into my daughter's very reluctant head, but we had fun together and we set up a, um, God, what do you call those? Pegboard, not pegboards, uh, cork boards with the uh, with the rope and the well string and the tacks. It's fun. Right now, you can go to huntakiller.com slash majority. Use the promo code majority for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use the code majority for a 20% discount. Answer the question, do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Uh, also, don't forget, Father's Day. Father's Day is right around the corner. This is a gift that you can get right up to the last minute, Emma. But honestly, I already got my gift. Well, this you want. But I might need to one. get a supplemental one. So this is a, worth a supplemental one. And frankly, it's also I I, the, I cannot recommend this enough, particularly for people well your age, but also you know my age in terms of your parents. Um, StoryWorth is an online service and it helps your dad, grandfather, father-in-law, every father figure in your life, but also frankly, your mom, your aunts, uh, your grandparents, your grandmothers. Uh, they share their stories, their life stories through thought provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. It's a great way to engage them, especially if you can't be in, in person together, but even uh, it, it is a way of, sort of capturing uh, just sort of their life memories uh, in a way that is easy and fun. Um, every week, StoryWorth emails your dad or whomever you get the gift for a different story prompt, questions you wouldn't even think about to ask, like, you know, what are the proudest moments? Uh, what, are you, uh, what are the things you're proudest of in your life? Or, you know, what was your favorite car? I mean, just stuff that you would, spurs like memories and conversations. 
So after one year, StoryWorth uh, compile all of dad's stories, including photos, and they put it into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. Um, this is a great way to reconnect with people that you haven't been in touch with for a while. But it's also, you know, you, you get to be my age and you, your parents, uh, you know, they don't have necessarily the, the recollection that, um, that you hope they would or, I mean, it, it happens, folks. And so a great way to sort of canonize, um, you know, people's lives. And it's also fun, I think, for, for younger people, too. Um, for, you know, they could do this check in every couple of years and see if their answers are the same. Uh, really a, a sweet gift that really gives uh, not only to, to, the, to the getter, but to the giver, frankly. So give your dad the most meaningful gift this Father's Day with StoryWorth. Get started right away. No shipping required by going to storyworth.com slash majority. You'll get $10 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash majority for $10 off. Uh, check it out, folks. We will put the uh, links uh, to um, both those in our YouTube and our podcast description. And just a reminder, our show, uh, it's folks like you who support our show. Become a member and... Um, you get the show commercial free and you get the fun half and you keep the show um, kicking along. All right, I wanna welcome, uh, I imagine it's gotta be back to the program, John B. Judas, editor at large at Talking Points Memo. He has a new book, which is um, in some respects, a compilation of, of three books since 2016. It is entitled The Politics of Our Time, Populism, Nationalism and Socialism. Uh, John B. Judas, uh, welcome uh, back to the program. I'm here with Emma Vigeland. Glad to be there. Uh, so let's, I guess, um, well, let's start with just sort of um, the, the, the three, we'll, we'll take them almost uh, in their three separate entities before we talk about why, you know, uh, how they interplay with each other. But give us a sense of, you know, what the history of populism, you know, uh, briefly has been in this country. Uh, up until now in the, in the slightly different strains of populism that we have? Well, populism really starts in the United States in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, in the South and the, and the Midwest and the prairies. And uh, it initially is a left-wing movement. It's not a, a right-wing movement. And it uh, pits the uh, people against the establishment or elites. Uh, who were in the establishment or uh, and elites, and who is who among who's the people, gets redefined with each generation politically. But the main thing is this kind of opposition, and um, what what we found in America is that we have both a left wing and a right wing variety. We have uh, uh, on the one hand we have uh, the populists of the eighteen nineties. Uh, we have Bernie Sanders uh, today. Um, we also have George Wallace uh, and we have Donald Trump. And the difference between the left wing and the right wing variety is you find many of the same issues domestically in terms of policy. Uh, George Wallace remained a new dealer. He was for progressive taxation, things like that. He's also a racist. Donald Trump uh, he was against multinational corporations being able to get up and leave uh, American workers in the lurch. Uh, he wanted better trade deals that uh, benefited American workers, but he was also um, saw uh, Mexicans who come into the country as rapists. Um, Charlottesville, the Nazis were fine people, you, you know, those kind of things. So I think with, with the right wing populists, you always get this third element which is to say that uh, the, the idea that the establishment is coddling African-Americans, Muslims, uh, illegal immigrants, what have you. There's always a third group. But in terms of the heart of the, the domestic stuff, you get mainly, you get, often you get the same kind of uh, politics. Populism arises when there's a significant minority of the people, and they could even be a majority that believe that the major parties and their leaders are not addressing the issues that are of concern to them. 
Uh, you know, that, that happens in the 1890s with the Republicans and Democrats, and it happens, uh, it's happened in our era with the leadership of the Republican and Democratic Party. I mean, Trump was responding really to, uh, again, um, the George, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Jeb Bush wing of the Republican Party really being ob oblivious to uh, the working class voters that were becoming interested in the Republican Party over the previous 20, 30 years. Uh, Bernie Sanders, again, to the, uh, to, to the wing of the uh, Democratic Party, the thought it was fine to give speeches to Goldman Sachs and not, you know, not report what you actually said to them, a promise, things like that. So again, it, it arises at these particular moments when, when what's breaking down is a consensus that's held together Republicans and Democrats in Europe, but uh, Christian uh, socialists and uh, Christian Democrats and social Democrats. So you have that's that's when pop populism is a kind of w early warning signal that there's a breakdown in the politics. It doesn't necessarily solve the problems, and that's certainly obvious uh, with Trump. But it's a sign that there are these big problems looming in the country that have to be addressed. Um, I want to, I want to, well, are there specific, aside from that sort of third element of right-wing populism, right, which involves um, making sure that you have some type of uh, other villain in, in addition to the elites or the ones that you think that the elites are coddling, I guess, um, how does the, the sort of policy sets line up with left-wing populism versus right-wing pol uh, populism? I mean, is it always just simply, is, it, it, are, are, is there any distinguishing factors between the, um, the economic um, uh, prescriptions of those two populist movements? Well, you, you know, with, with Trump, again, let's, let's say, let me say what was, what was positive and what was negative. There are some things that Trump did that Biden has carried over that are very positive. And one of the things would be uh, industrial policy, the idea that the government has to take a greater role in encouraging uh, uh, industries that are vital to the American national security, Ameri to America having its own steel industry, are, are not ceding the rare earth minerals to, to China, whatever. You know, that was positive. The, you know, Operation Warp Speed, that, that's a that was a triumph of not just American technology, but what happens when you have the government taking a big role uh, and supervising and regulating and at the same time subsidizing uh, industry. So, you know, that's that was, again, a, a positive aspect. Well, the, you know, the negative aspect was uh, the, the uh, st stigmatizing immigrants, um, a lot of anti-union stuff, uh, in spite of the fact that Trump and his campaign uh, s sang a different song, right. uh, he really uh, let the the, um, uh, the Labor Department uh, declare war on uh, you know on, on unions, make it very difficult to to organize. Uh, the regressive uh, tax bill that he passed. So you know, I, again, I think that that's the kind of characteristic you get with uh, with the right wing po uh, populism that you wouldn't have gotten with a let's say a, a Sanders presidency, or you know, with again with Biden, who has incorporated a lot of um, a lot of what uh, the issues and approaches that were presented both by Sanders and Trump in 2016. Um, let's move on to nationalism. And we should say that you, you, you sort of uh, in, in real time uh, wrote these uh, books that are now sort of, I guess, sections of this big book um, as, as these things were unfurling. I mean, uh, does, are these things always sequential on some level as they uh, begin to percolate in society? Um, or is there a certain inevitability if you've got a, certain type of uh, populism, the, the, the context that a populist movement grows in also will create a nationalist movement? 
Uh, the, in American politics, I think you often find uh, populism and nationalism uh, joined, and certainly in Europe, uh, they're very much uh, uh, joined. The, the The point that I really wanted to make in the na in about nationalism is that a common national sentiment, the idea that we're all, you know, that there's something called Americans, that there's something called the, the French, uh, this kind of idea, which we grow up with uh, as Americans, is essential to democracy and it's essential to having an advanced welfare state where I'm going to be paying taxes uh, to support people, uh, you know, to provide, um, uh, insurance, uh, to, to provide roads, build, for people that I will never see or know. I have to believe that those people are worthy of my support because they are Americans. And when that kind of sentiment begins to break down, when some people say, well, these, these aren't real Americans, we're supporting illegal immigrants or whatever, then the, you know, the welfare state itself start, starts to break down. So that's very important. Then there, there's another can, step, and can that I just is ask you uh, just about that that in okay. terms of nationalism, because um, the the way that you frame that in terms of um, it, it's important to have some type of uh, of a pride and shared uh, belonging, but it seems to me that one can be nationalist and say, yes, no, I am uh, uh, all about America, but I'm also going to be rather specific as to who I include as being American. Um, so I'm not going to support, uh, you know, that subset of people or not. Yes, that, and that's obviously that's when it becomes uh, problematic. But it also is problematic on the other side when you pe have people saying, well, you know, uh, I'm a cosmopolitan. I think we should be citizens of the world. I don't think we should. I think we should have we should be as much concerned in our policy with what's going on uh, to people in, let's say, South America, as we are concerned with people who are going uh, in South Chicago. That's not a, a, a way of doing business politically that accords with our own psychology, with our national psychology. And I think that some people on the left refuse to understand that, that, that this question of, is this policy in the national interest is very important and has to be taken into consideration. Is there one, you know, I think democratic politician who positions themselves in that way though, to say that, oh, I'm, we're going to be just as concerned with somebody in this Asian country or this, you know, whatever, Thailand, pick a random nation, than we are going to be with the citizens of Indiana. I mean, th the flip side uh, of that is uh, I think that the right wing extremism is a legitimate, is legitimately represented by a number of Republican politicians. Right. And I don't see this posture as actually being said by one democratic politician okay so let's do it two, two things first on the uh, in terms of the of the intelligentsia and it's not just li left wing it's liberal you do find people taking these positions and you know i i qu quoted my old friend D dylan matthews from vox and um, he's a former new republic colleague in my book uh, so yeah you do find that the extreme position and it's been debated uh, over history um the other side, the more common side, is the idea that comes up during the democratic debates. Should we have, uh, should we offer free uh, health care if we have Medicare for all to anybody who's in the country? In other words, regardless of whether they pay taxes, been here, past citizenship, residency, and the Democrats all raise their hand. Well, not all of them, but most of them. That again is a rec is is a failure to recognize the importance of nationality and citizenship uh, to having these kind of an advanced welfare society. So that's the uh, that that's what I say would say is among politicians of a liberal or democratic stripe the more common way in which this occurs. I mean, I think the other thing is a, is an indifference to border security as an issue. 
which well, concerns I, many Americans. There again, you get you you get a feeling that well, it just the you know some some version of open or virtually open borders is a failure to recognize that as a nation, uh, we have to regulate who is and is not a citizen. And but isn't there would... isn't there something I think a moral difference in between saying oh we're going to allow people who are not citizens to access our healthcare system and have free healthcare then we are going to demonize an entire group and be isolationist and say uh, dr drum up populist sentiment with you know by by saying immigrants are bad etc i mean one yeah, yeah. One, if you're gonna... one is the uh, one is the uh, one is a malady on the right one and the other is a malady on the left i mean i don't see you it know as a obviously i you know i i, I it's I, if you weighted them if you weighted them on the great moral scale i would say that you know the right is worse but um, uh, again, if you look at Canada with its single payer system, you, you can't uh, just go into Canada and demand, uh, let's say, a preventative health care checkup. In the United States, you go into an emergency room and no matter who you are, you know, there's, a, a, again, people who are not undocumented get care as well as people who are here as citizens. But in terms of normal care, surgery, all this kind of stuff, it's, uh, again, Canada's single payer system uh, wor works according to rules and according to rules that you have to be show proof of residency, all this kind of stuff. And, you, you know, it's very hard to run a, a, a a national system if you don't have that, uh, just in fiscal terms, but it's also a problem, again, in terms of taxpayers uh, supporting people that they don't know that they're not gonna you know, ever meet. So that, in that sense, yes, national, nationality and a sense of nationality is really important to programs that we support. Is this, and I'm just trying to understand, are you saying from a, um, from a functioning standpoint or from a, as a, as a political matter? I mean, I, I, both, my experience both. In, that's what I'm saying. Both. My, my experience in, in both in, in, in Europe and in Australia was, um, I, when I was in Australia, I had uh, some ear problems over the course of months. And, uh, I just, I walked in, nobody looked at my, uh, documentation or anything to that effect. And I think I've had a similar experience in, in, in France, but, um, but putting that, uh, you know, is it, it is as a functioning matter, what would, what would be problematic? We have a good sense of how many people are in this country at any given time, relatively speaking. Um, we, we can, we could, you could, you could take that measure. I mean, I don't want to get too hung up on the specifics of this, but we know how many people go into the emergency room. We, you know, we, we can extrapolate how many people, um, have a connection with Yes, a that's right. We know that, but in terms of normal benefits that people get from being an American and paying taxes, leave aside the emer emergency room, um, we have a right as Americans to believe that there should be certain qualifications before people get those benefits. They shouldn't just be given to everybody. I'll, gi I'll give you another example from the British Labor Party, which got into a lot of trouble over the last three or four years. And part of it was, again, over, over their rejection of a sense of nationality. Uh, at the Brighton Labor Conference before the election in 2019, um, they voted to allow people who were residents from any of the EU countries to vote in national elections. Now, that just seems to me nuts. But again, I think that's an example. It's not, you know, racist or bigoted, and it's not Nazis, it's not right wing, I, I but it's a denial of a basic a, a kind of idea of nationality that you need in order to have a functioning democracy or welfare state. I'm just not clear. I, I feel like we're we're. I feel like it. It. Uh, we keep uh, shifting categories here in terms of like, um, like the idea that if we had a Medicare. For, I mean, we do this with public education, right? I mean, right. you're allowed to go to public education regardless of whether you're a citizen or not. That doesn't break down public education. I mean, from a, as a political matter, if you're saying that it creates a certain amount of resentment, that's a that's one case. 
uh, that 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 one could make. But as a as a functionality matter, we, it works in public education. If what you were saying was correct, we wouldn't have a, a functioning public school system. Well, we have a functioning public school system, but it has a lot of problems. And you can look in California and Texas, and there is it does breed a lot of uh, resentment. I'm not look, but my, here's my you, I, I mean, I will tell you my position, which is that we should have we should have a path to citizenship for the whatever ten between ten and twelve million undocumented, un, unauthorized immigrants who are in this country, but particularly with respect to unskilled immigrants who come through the into the country and compete with people uh, who don't have uh, college educations. And uh, we should be very careful about that. And one way of doing security, it's not so much the building walls, but some kind of e-verify program uh, that would allow that would force employers to verify whether someone is has a green card or is a citizen before hiring. So if you had some combination of that, you'd have the best of, bo of both worlds. You wouldn't have this uh, huge underclass in this country of people who are he not here legally uh, and who are easily exploitable. But at the same time, you you would start you would start to have a situation, you know, which we see the kind of kind of thing happening now, uh, where people who are who have only a high school education or a one year of community college suddenly find themselves in a much stronger bargaining position vis a vis. Uh, employers than they've had over the last 50 or 60 years. And one of the reasons they haven't had, they haven't had a good position is because there have been so many uh, unskilled, uh, without education Im Im immigrants coming in the country, many of them illegally, uh, who compete with them. So uh, again, that my, my program is both sides. Uh, okay. do I do path to citizenship plus E-Verify. I, I mean, I, like, I don't want to get too, again, I don't want to get too hung up here, but my sense is that the reason why we have a different situation right now is not because we have, uh, we have less competition in that labor market. And we've been at net, um, we have been at net zero of uh, immigration for, for years now. Uh, it is because we have um, a as more of a robust um, unemployment benefits and also uh, with the child tax credits and the funding that we have provided over the course of three COVID bills, which is creating that dynamic for uh, low wage workers, as opposed to they're not going out and competing for jobs right now. Yeah, we have both. We have both. Uh, net, uh, pretty much net zero Im immigration, and uh, the and the unemployment benefits and childcare, and that's right. My point really is, boosting. That's right. boosting wages in a way we haven't seen for. I, I agree. Years. We've had that net yeah. zero immigration for, for yeah. quite a while, though. I mean, that has been. We we've had that dynamic for. I know, but we've had. Uh, we we haven't had that uh, uh, for a long time. And the, the time when we see the, uh, the real problems happening from, let's say, you know, 1980 to the early 2000s, it's a time when we had enormous increases in immigration. And we had, at the same time, uh, we had uh, companies uh, successfully beating down the uh, union. So, you know, I think if you put those two together, you see a lot of the problems of, of how America has become uh, so unequal and, and particularly how the uh, lower 30, 40% has really gotten screwed over, over the last, um, you know, really since, since uh, 70s, 1980s. And, right. you know, just to add one more point, you know, when we had the, the, the enormous achievement of those civil rights acts in the, in the mid 1960s, uh, what that meant was really uh, was, was we were in a position where a lot of, um, of American blacks who could not enter the main, mainstream were suddenly in a position where they, where they could legally, let's leave aside the discrimination. But at the same time, that was the period where we had the uh, immigration reform, 1965, family reunification. So we get in cities like Los Angeles and Chicago, uh, uh, African-Americans with only high school education having to compete 
uh, for jobs, I think that you would have seen a different situation. Again, if we would have had a better sense of our own nationality and what our labor needs were, um, et cetera. So I'm, I'm just repeat, going back to the same point um, about, about the importance of nation, nationality, doing things that are in the national interest, worrying about our citizens here. And I'm not saying we shouldn't worry about people uh, elsewhere. And obviously there are a lot of issues like climate change that we can't do by ourselves. I mean, we have to do with other people, uh, pandemics among them. So, so I'm not against internationalism, but I'm arguing for a certain sense of nationalism. Well, let, and let me just, uh, to, uh, just last question to put it to rest so I get it, so I'm, I'm clear. If we had a system where um, we, everyone, we, we would allow anyone to come into the country, but of course we would, but not, uh, you know, there would be a border and we would, we would you know, uh, take your information and would say, you know, if you want, uh, we put everybody on a path to citizenship who walks through um, in some fashion. Would that be problematic? I'm just trying to get at I mean, anybody. The yes, that would be a disaster uh, for for the uh, for workers in this country. It would destroy unions. Okay. It would, uh, we wouldn't have 10 percent. We would have like three uh, percent unionized because there would just be too much of a glut of uh, workers on the market and employers would be in an extraordinarily uh, strong position. Okay. You'd also have a lot of uh, city, uh, towns that felt that they were uh, you know, over overtaxed, you know, and uh, so, having to uh, that, provide benefits so that they couldn't afford. But, I, I, I mean, uh, so that that's is, the that so would be a, my answer. A math yeah. situation, and then the resentment that would come from it. Both both ends would be problematic. I mean, those are yes. two separate uh, uh, equations. It seems to me. Um, all right, so uh, so th this is the part yeah. that that I think you you would argue that the left doesn't understand where where, where that nationalism. Uh, the importance of that nationalism and um, where it, uh, why it's bubbling up uh, in such a, like a, in, in both virulent ways and in ways that are helpful. That's, that, would that be fair? Yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, socialism. Where does the socialism emanate from? Uh, the socialism to me has just been, has astonished me because I was a, you know, I was a socialist in the uh, 60s and former uh, editor of Socialist Revolution, a uh, journal from, that was put out in San, San Francisco, it was later called Socialist Review. Uh, but uh, by the 1980s or so, um, uh, very much like what happened to Bernie Sanders, uh, I, I started to question what socialism really could mean in the United States. And um, I still defend it theoretically, but then all of a sudden in the 2010s, you see these start, before Bernie Sanders runs, you start to see these polls where uh, kids, and we're talking about like 18 to 29 year olds, suddenly 50% say they doubt, uh, well, you know, whether capitalism is a good system and they consider socialism. And so really what's happened is we've had this kind of revival of socialism, but it's not been the socialism that I understood in the 1960s, the word, worker ownership and control of the means of production, a kind of vision of uh, a democratic version of the Soviet Union where you'd have central planning of some kind, but you'd also have democracy. Uh, it's been much more like Scandinavia. It's been much more in the old spirit of Christian socialism, cooperation, uh, racial, sexual equality, issues like that. And, uh, you know, from my standpoint, enormously po positive and uh, pr promising for American politics, but still uh, limited in terms of its appeal, because, you know, for most of the people in America who are over, let's say, age 45, uh, they grew up in the shadow of the Cold War. And this happened in the election in 2020. Um, you know, that socialism still means Soviet Union, Venezuela, Cuba, what have you. So I think that's a big reason Biden had enormous amount of trouble in South Florida. Bernie Sanders would have had trouble around the country, I think, uh, except for, you know, some zip codes in New York City and some college towns and stuff, stuff like that because of socialism. But again, from my standpoint, it's been an enormously positive development. 
And, you know, he, with Biden himself or with Elizabeth Warren, what you see to a great extent is a kind of shadow socialism. I mean, they don't they wouldn't call themselves socialists. And Warren specifically said she wouldn't. But you see the same kind of attempt to shift power and wealth from, away from capital, away from uh uh, the, you know, big, big owners toward labor, towards workers, toward ordinary people. Uh, that's characteristic of uh, of socialism. And, you know, obviously with Warren and, and with Biden's uh, relief and recovery programs as well. So, you know, all, all power and maybe in 20 or 30 years, a lot of these things will be uh, acceptable. It'll be acceptable to have a debate over democratic so socialism. But right now, again, I think it's limited in terms of its uh, political appeal. What um, wh what is the relationship between these three? These these three. I mean, where you know, I mean, is there is there a, a sequencing that goes on here, or do when you get a populist uh, sentiment? Um, does it, it that is across the country? Do you get the context for populism? Right. Is it inevitable that out of that will come uh, nationalism and and socialism? I mean, well, in, in, in a vacuum, right? I mean, because I, I mean, I would actually, I'd I'd push back a little bit on the uh, forty five year old uh, threshold, because uh -huh. as as a member of like a of uh, you know as as almost a fifty five year old myself. Um, you are. I, That's amazing. I don't believe it. Well, 54. <laughs> um, but as as uh, as as someone in that age group myself, I think yeah. it wasn't so much the Soviet Union as it was living in the um, living in the shadow of the rejection of, of the yippies and the hippies um, that uh, for my generation. But I don't want to get uh, too far into yeah. the Gen X uh, uh, thing. But um, I think the absence of the essentially the baggage from the Cold War and from uh, you know what we saw in the '60s, um, people there was no obstacles to sort of uh, embracing socialism for a lot of younger people. And I can tell you that uh, with a 15-year-old daughter, I can uh -huh. tell you that what's happening with the even younger kids uh, is even uh, more dramatic. Yes. Um, uh, to the extent that one can get a, a, a notion from TikTok and uh, Snapchat, but, um, but 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 in terms of like the context for these uh, different ideologies to grow, wh wh how do they relate to each other? Um, putting the nationalism aside for a minute, populism, socialism, because you know the American Socialist Party starts r right after uh, the uh, heyday of American populism. 1901 versus let's say 1892 um, they they're both responses to a breakdown in in consensus in the prevailing uh, in, in in the prevailing politics of the time in the 1890s uh, it was uh, laissez-faire capitalism the idea that um, go government uh, should uh, help, help business but not anybody else labor unions should be illegal um, there shouldn't be such a thing as uh, as unemployment insurance so on so on any all these things that uh, a lot of these things that eventually were adopted by the new deal that that gives rise to both the populists and the socialists at the same time. Um, at our present time, I think you know you have to look at the Great Recession as a really key event uh, in prompting uh, po populism and socialism on both the left and the right. I mean, the Tea Party was group and Occupy Wall Street both in their own odd ways come out of the Great Recession. The uh, upsurge of, of uh, skepticism about capitalism uh, among the young comes out of the uh, Great Recession. And the idea that, uh, again, if you look at the, the heart of the socialists, I, uh, from what I could tell from the votes, were kids who had gone to college but not post-grad. I mean, it was this certain group that end up, a lot of whom end up uh, working as Uber drivers uh, who thought they were going to do much better. Um, again, I think that's a lot of that pro is a product of the uh, Great Recession. And now on top of that, we have the pandemic and the, you know, the cur current recession, which is increasing it and which is also 
um, undermining one of the central ideas of, of a more conservative outlook, which is that uh, government is bad and that it's uh, that the way to get the economy moving, society moving is to withdraw uh, government. And, you know, with both Trump, Sanders, uh, later with the Democratic can candidates now, uh, complete repudiation of that idea and the idea that government's very necessary. And, the, you know, the pandemic made that point in spades. And, uh, you know, the, just the last thing I'll say is that the, uh, you know, the Demo there recently was this, uh, I think this week, this bipartisan uh, bill on industrial policy was passed, inconceivable 20 exactly. years ago, that Republicans and Democrats would do that. And, you know, it's justified in terms of threats from China, but you know, there's no, we should have a semiconductor industry in this country. I mean, it's important. Pharmaceuticals, we should make a lot of things. We shouldn't have to rely on other people. And that'll build up a middle class again in the country. So those are all good things. Uh, and a lot of them are products of the disillusion with the kind of, I guess, neoliberal is the term that people use or market liberalism that prevailed in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And it was just uh, completely destroyed by the Great Recession. Right. And, and, and that had cut across both uh, parties. So, so give me a sense of what you think happens uh, next. I mean, there's obviously a lot of factors. Um, if if I had told you that there was a burgeoning populist movement, it might be predictable that we would see um, the, uh, you know, uh, rise in at least right wing nationalism um, and in, in socialism on some level. And, and, and I don't I don't know that we've seen the left wing uh, nationalism that you're, uh, you're you're talking, you know, or broadly uh, embraced on the on the left anyways. Um, but where, where would you anticipate uh, what we would see next? Well, first, let me say that B Biden does embrace. And I, again, left liberal in this country, the terms get mixed up anyway. But, you, you know, you heard him in his uh, in, in his uh, speech when he won the election and in his state of the, the United States of America. I mean, he made a big deal about it. And uh, I think the Biden people understand that uh, to be an important issue. Well, you know, we're in a very uh, touchy situation in this country and the similar, I would say, in continental Europe, uh, but, you know, we don't have to get into that, uh, where um, uh, we're really facing uh, in the 2022 and 2024 elections, a return to the kind of um, stalled realignment, the kind of um, uh, unstable equilibrium that we faced for the last uh, 20, 30 years. I mean, Biden, Biden's really trying to break through. And uh, in order to break through, he's going to, the Democrats are going to have to win uh, and they're going to have to uh, keep the House and uh, increase their margin a few votes in the Senate in order to continue to do these things and in order to credit to give credit and credibility uh, publicly uh, to the kind of government intervention that they propose. There is in the, I mean, I, I you know, I have to say, I, I, I continually be shocked by Trump. I mean, I thought in 2017, he would sort of sand off the rough edges from his campaign and be presidential. And, you know, we got, we really did get a demagogue, a very dangerous one. And then what happened after November uh, election was also pretty scary. I don't know how, how much that's going to continue in the Republican party and how much a danger to our uh, democracy uh, it, it, it will pose. I would imagine if the Democrats win in 2022, what you'll see is a lot of Demo uh, Republicans finally uh, realizing that they have to part ways with Trump. And, uh, you know, what you might see is a, a Republican politics, you know, embodied by somebody like Marco Rubio, uh, that finds some common ground uh, with Democrats on the subject of government and the economy. So, you know, that, that's the most, uh, that, that would be the most positive outlook that I could give you. Uh, the negative one you, you can give yourself, which is, uh, you, well, you know, Trump, are... uh, voter suppression, uh, real doubts about 
uh, American democracy. And that looms in a way that it's never loomed before in my lifetime. I mean, it, I think uh, 2022, the idea that it's going to be a, um, that Democrats are going to pick up seats seems hard to imagine. Um, uh, one, one seat in the Senate, I, I'd say. I mean, there are enough vulnerable elections. The House, they just, they have to keep it. And right. I'm, I'm more worried about the House. Uh, that's interesting. And I, I, I let me just uh, just touch on the uh, on your rosy scenario in terms of like the Republicans, I mean, because from my perspective, the Tea Party was the only material difference between the Tea Party, it seems to me, and uh, let's say the moral majority that you could you could virtually uh, draw a, a, a direct line there, it seems to me. The only difference is uh, money that that was an era uh, in the Tea Party where there was a tremendous amount of money, a lot of it Coke uh, money, but also, you know, Foster Freeze. And there was, you know, uh, you know, back in the, you know, in the, the, the aughts or pre aughts, even it was just, you know, the scafes maybe, and that's about it and a couple others, but there was a tremendous amount of money that, that crept into Republican politics. So there was a, uh, the ideology was really uh, no different. It just been rebranded, but the funding sources were independent and basically grew uh, a, a sort of a competing uh, a product within a, you know, what was more or less the same sector. Uh, but from an ideological standpoint, there was really nothing tremendously different. It was just, you know, which team am I on in this exact same uh, league, essentially? Okay, well, look, look let me say a few things. I, I, was, uh, I was doing a, a story on the Tea Party and what was it like 2010? And you remember Grover Norquist? He's now he's now uh, he's no longer a big shot in Washington no. the way he was then. Yeah, and uh, he was always a good person to talk to about this stuff. And he said, you know, all these movements are fungible. That was the group the, the word he used. Anti-tax. He's saying the same thing you're saying. Anti-tax, religious right. They just change their coloration. And I, you know, again, I think that 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 a lot of the Tea Party. Uh, has vanished because it be, went into Trump. I mean, they're now Trump supporters. They're MAGA, and, right. They're and the MAGA. people that I interviewed then uh, from the Tea Party, who incidentally stopped talking to me a few years ago, they, they are, you know, media, blah, blah, we won't talk to you, uh, went, into the, uh, went, into, went into the Trump world. So yeah, that's point one. As far as the Tea Party itself, it was a funny kind of movement because it was, on the one hand, a very decentralized movement of all these groups that, you know, in order to understand, you had to go, you could look on the web pages, you could go locally, and they had a lot of different uh, kinds of ideas. Uh, and um, illegal immigration was a big deal, especially in the, in the South and so Southwest, but, you know, more anti-tax anti-government uh, elsewhere. On the other hand, they had these huge group, uh, Americans for Prosperity and Freedom Works that were uh, funded by plutocrats, the, right. the Koch network. Now, one of the things that happened in the, in the Republican Party, and I saw this when I used to cover the, the uh, Christian coalition, is that the, the, the people, the Koch network people, are not of, uh, they're free traders. They're uh, also open borders people. I'm using, again, in open borders. They want, you know, the yeah. immigrants, fine. You know, let them in. Uh, a guest workers, great, great idea. Uh, they're not pro-Trump. So there is this kind of real division in the Republican Party that, that's going to have to play out between the, uh, the, you could say, the Carl Rove wing, Chamber of Commerce wing, and the base that uh, is this group of people that have come up, moral majority, Christian coalition, guns for America, well, you know, whatever, through that are now Trump, Trump supporters. And um, that's, that's, again, that's to the Democrats' advantage, but uh, it's also scary because the, the Trump people are genuinely, uh, have taken an authoritarian turn. John B. Judas, uh, at our large talking points memo. The book is Politics of Our Time, Populism, Nationalism, Socialism. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. That, that was really fun. And I like it when you argue with me. <laughs> uh, well, we, maybe we could do that again. I appreciate, appreciate you coming on.
All right. We're going to take a quick break, folks. We'll be right back after this. Well, that was um, uh, was a a, a uh, energetic uh, exchange. I thought. I mean, I think that look, there is um, uh, it is it is interesting to get like you know sort of that layout of the different uh, sort of uh, responses uh, at the. Um, but the bottom line is there is a problem uh, in our society, uh, and different people react differently to it. Uh, and, um, and so there, there needs to be something fundamentally fixed within the context of our government. I think that part is clear and we can all agree on. Um, but with that said, another thing we agree on is, uh, that, the for those of you watching us on Peacock, we will see you tomorrow. And for those of you who are, uh, still with us on, uh, our other uh, distribution uh, platforms, or maybe listening even into the future. Uh, we are going to head into the fun half of the program. Um, Want to thank uh, David Feldman for coming on today. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, he's not going to come on today. Maybe we'll have him on Friday. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, no, we, I think we're booked, right? Um, so, uh, folks, just a reminder, it is your support that makes the show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you uh, not only uh, get the free show free of commercials, you, um, you support the show, and you get fun half material every single day practically. I mean, for the most part, you get it every single day, but I'm not going to – I like to manage expectations. Right. Who knows? Maybe, you know, I guess last week we did a show – where we didn't even have a fun app. Uh, that was a tech day. Yeah, I mean, it's not probably not the best idea to to manage expectations when you're trying to get people to become members, though. Maybe just say the whole say the <laughs> no, that's say the, the best reality. Time. That's the uh, yeah. That is, uh, I, we could have this debate. Um, I can tell you, whatever is we're the, in the mood today. I guess whatever is in the least effective. Uh, means of getting uh, members. That's what I'm good at. Yeah. That's where I bring in my, I bring out the big guns uh, in terms of my uh, business. Um, <coughs> but <laughs> we're getting people on the IM are really going to town right now. Uh, really going to town. I, I quite enjoy that. I, I would like to go. Maybe, uh, maybe more, maybe more of that. If that's what people like, if they're into well, that sort of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could have like as soon as the initial the the disagreement in our perspectives was illuminated. I was like, I could debate. We could debate this guy, or we could, you know, learn what his book's about. And so, right. I mean, I kept I kept saying like, I, I don't want to keep going sideways on this, but it, it there was I have to say, and you know, in a, a sort of a more uh, open format and 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 anticipating this. Um, a conflation, it seemed to me, at times, between what was, you know, what one could perceive as a political reality or political limitations versus a uh, practical reality or limitations. Um, if you wanted to, I mean, if you wanted to make a case for some of these things in terms of how you're going to brand it politically, as you're saying, I'm more sympathetic to that argument. Right. Than but I, I mean, am. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have had an experience in France with healthcare where a half day of care and no questions asked. And my understanding is France is a pretty developed sense of nationalism. Um, but I, and I think the other, like the more serious point is with regards to like open borders or even like the path to citizenship, citizenship for all comers, if the left was in a position to do that, it'd also be in a position to alter the oh, environment yes. of labor yes. exploitation I mean, in this country. Exactly. I mean, that is the thing that I think is like a little bit, 
there's nobody going out there who are saying my entire policy prescription is to just do this one thing, right? Like, like, yes, it is the case that um, more low wage, uh, low skilled uh, workers would depress wages and create more competition amongst um, low skilled workers. In fact, more if you let in high uh, skilled workers, uh, it would also at one point. That's such a classist uh, classification, though, too. I mean, it's just like. Well, I mean, it's it's a way of describing just sort of like, you know, how much education that you've had that, w you know, w what kind of jobs that you w would be available uh, to you in uh, and what kind of skills would match up. But uh, but you could you could make the same argument with with um, high skilled if you thought that there was going to be as many coming in. Um, but. The whole point is, is that, and I, this is the point I was trying to make with why we have seen um, wages rise in this country has not been a function of, of uh, a lack of uh, low wage uh, workers uh, coming in. I guess conceivably you could say that during the, uh, during COVID there was, you know, people were shut out uh, to a certain extent. I imagine there was some, but we had net zero immigration to this country uh, from Mexico across the Mexican border for years and years and years. And we didn't see wages rise that the impetus now, ultimately, I guess, I mean, if we, uh, you know, the impetus, for uh, rising wages has been in part um, a function of a couple of things, it seems to me. One being that people are trying to ramp up their production and get their businesses going so quickly that they don't have the time to wait around to find uh, the workers willing to work at that crappy job for that crappy pay. Um, and there's also workers are basically saying like, you know what, I'm not as desperate. I mean, this is ultimately what it comes down to. And more workers on one side that are competing against you, and then more things that have been, for lack of a better term, decommodified because you're getting payments. They're not technically decommodified, but they're not as uh, the, the, the needs that you have are not as coercive in that moment because they're being subsidized in some function. Um, that's where worker power comes from. And the only thing that's changed on those two sides was the, the side that uh, provided subsidies so that um, the need to work was not as coercive. Um, I don't think that's what's keeping people uh, from, from going back to jobs. I think to a certain extent, there's still, we have a lot of jobs open, but, um, but I think, uh, there's a lot of factors that are, are raising wages, but I, the idea that it's necessarily like the, the only policy program that would be implemented would be open borders. And then everything else is exactly the same. It's a little bit hard to. Uh, and, and there's no one on the left in power that's advocating for that. Um, but to me, like I, the conflation of left-wing populism with the faux populism on the right, AKA nationalism, I mean, I, 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 like that would be a per he should be interviewed by Sagar for that new show they're doing. It's like a perfect fit. Wow, Emma. All right, we're gonna take a uh, uh, a quick break and um, we'll be back in a moment. Matt, before you go, tell us, I mean, before we go, tell us what's happening in the Matt Leckian universe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, last night I played about two and a half hours. We did, uh, I, I got routed at Shiloh um, in the Civil War. I did not, um, you know, retreat fast enough. And uh, so you can see me losing that. Uh, but anyway, tomorrow night, or, <laughs> yeah, tomorrow night we have Joshua Khan Russell talking about mental health, which is uh, it, uh, timely, I think, probably for the last four years. And also we'll be talking about psychedelics. So that's tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern, Left Reckoning. Go subscribe to the YouTube page, folks. Uh, don't forget the AM Quickie and see you in the fun half. 646-257-3920. Check out Nomi Show, youtube.com slash the Nomiki Show. Left
this bad. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Okay, well, uh, welcome, folks. We're just sitting here, um, uh, you know, still ruminating on um, uh, our guest, and and, and my, um, my my are we back? Yeah, my oh, complaints. Hi. We are back. Uh, we were just, you know, Matt and I were just arguing. Well, we weren't arguing with each other. We were we were talking about the um, about our guest. Um, the my frustration was uh two or three part um i think there was a conflation between the argument about the politics of and and look your point emma about there's no politician getting out there that's saying open borders he he was saying that that moment in the debate was indicative of at least how that message is received the idea the, that the border you know that the 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 open borders was manifested in the idea that we're going to have the biggest national plan, you know, um, uh, intervention by government in our economy, which would be single payer health care. And it would be open to people who are not even citizens. And that and, and, and I and I think that that's a fair um sort of like you, you can take you, you i think that's a fair example of the i the you know like sort of a extension of the notion of of open borders or at least i think you know in, in a charitable light i think you could say that um i mean it's obviously not the same but as a political question i could see that being received by people who don't want more immigrants in this country um and uh but 
as a like as a matter of policy in terms of like can you operate a single payer healthcare system with you know allowing um, with with far greater migra- immigration or even with the immigration system we have now well that's an actually like you can assess that you could say it's going to cost a hundred billion dollars more a year or whatever it is um, you didn't feel like you had that kind of data on the other side if you're making an argument that when you go out there and say, we're gonna have single payer healthcare and everybody's gonna be allowed to use it, you are going to lose this cohort of voter and you need them because here is your coalition. I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of assertions that were made that may or may not be able to be substantiated, but were not. With that said, Let's go to the phones. Emma, Emma's like stewing. I've never I'm not seen stewing. You just angry. Call I'm, from a five four one area code. Who's this? On, Careful, second, Emma on. is mad. I'm listening. Five four one. Hi, this is Adrian. Adrian, talk a little bit more into your phone. Give me one second. Hmm. Now is not is the time to get, to get to look for my patience, Adrian. Don't push. I'm sorry. Is this better? <laughs> Barely. Are you a libertarian? No, of course, uh, of course not. Well, your phone is sort of acting like it, but go I ahead. Like it, but go ahead. What's up? Better. I've got my earphones out. Yeah, that's not better. But go ahead, Adrian. What's on your mind? Hi, first time caller, long time listener. Um, my wife and I are trying to expat out of the country. Uh, we were originally trying to go to Canada. Recently, we've been trying to go to Singapore. And they're on lockdown currently. And so we actually are have interviewed in a job with China and are looking to expat to China to help with speech therapy there. Uh, originally, they actually don't have it. And this company started right around when speech therapy started in 2008. So just curious on your opinion on expatting to China. Uh, dude, I would love to travel. Let's put it this way. I have no absolutely no basis whatsoever to give you any type of opinion on expatting to China. I I don't know that I could give you an opinion on expatting to anywhere, but I definitely can't do it uh, with expatting to China. All I can tell you is make your life look like a beautiful tapestry when you're done as you look back on it. And that sounds like an exciting adventure. Hey, thanks a lot, man. I just wanted your quick opinion. All right. Have a good day. You too. That was also not what I had anticipated for the first call. Well, just the day is full of surprises today. Uh, I, I is Mercury in retrograde? <laughs> uh, is that how that works? Calling from a 631 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Jason from Troy, New York. Jason from Troy, New York. What's on your mind, Jason? Um, well, I, I, I wanted to call in for um, mainly to give you some news that hopefully will be good news, which is that partially your libertarian debates were part of you know, a, a suite of factors, but definitely was a big entry point for me sort of getting away from the new right and sort of becoming more confident in holding leftist politics um, because I, I sort of, I feel like I have a very, uh, what's the right word? I think I was very lucky to avoid a trajectory that might have ended in a different life or a different, you know, if things played out differently, I think maybe I could be, have been a proud boy in some other life, you know? Wow. Um, what, like what, wh- where were you at that point where the, you, you could have, you, w- you know, tell me about that moment of that crossroads, I guess. Um, so yeah, parents were very liberal and sort of very democratic party line growing up. Didn't really discuss, um, reasons for political beliefs. And I sort of had a fundamental disagreement with them that was over me not being very religious and then sort of, um, at least particularly my mom valuing me becoming a war mitzvah. But all this to say, I sort of was involved in high school, like sort of primed, I guess, by watching sort of 
new atheist type uh, things like, you know, old Hitchens clips or, yeah. you know, funnily enough <laughs> to invoke him, but Sam Harris um, and other figures like that, which I think in hindsight definitely just sort of contributed to, I had like sort of a distaste for religion, but that sort of translates into very easily Islamophobia through the right sort of people like Hitchens and Sam and Harris sort of like feeding that into this. Um, yeah, they they are yeah. very anti. Um, uh, they are they are anti-religious, but very anti a specific religion. Uh, Sam Harris, yeah, you, you'll appreciate this. Sam Harris, a lot of his his touring around was sponsored by by brotherhoods at synagogues. You know, there <laughs> and, and he would do a lot of like talks at temples. For a guy who was so again, and I wonder how much of it was there, like going like, incidentally, you guys are all organized around a book that talks about an ocean going apart like this. So I mean, come on, I mean, I don't think that happened uh, so much. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely. Um, I definitely think that's like a major way I was primed. But like, so just like to the, I, I sort I go to college. I'm sort of exploring. Cause sort of my mindset is right. Like I've, I've heard, I sort of feel like it's like a way that like liberalism kind of failed me in a certain way. And it's also like, obviously the radicalization pipeline of like, I start watching a friend recommends a Steven Crowder video. Like I changed my mind, which appeals to that like debate instinct. Yep. And then it's like, okay, introduced to Steven Crowder. And I'm like, Oh, well, Joe Rogan had Steven Crowder on. Let me watch that. And then it's like, okay, so you know, it's just like the, the cross pollination network that I think has been very uh, well well established. But you know, until I find myself watching a, a Gavin McInnes video and being like, oh, you know, kind of funny. But like, I think one of the main ways that kept me from sort of falling deep deeper in is just having any like meaningful emotional relationship with women in my life, because um, that sort of makes you like balk at when when things get like hard sexist in like a, right. a Gavin McInnes video or something. It's like, oh, you get that feeling in your gut. Like, oh, I shouldn't be enjoying this. Like they're, clear, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, but sort of at that, like the, the, it's like right at the crossroads where I, it was like just prior to COVID, but um, that was sort of when I was most to the right was like pro just prior to COVID. Cause I'm graduated. I'm working a job that I don't really like commuting a lot, have very little free time. Most of my time is commuting or working, so I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, which just sort of puts you in this like uh, continual reaffirmation of like the worst things that you. Uh, I mean, if you're watching, if you're listening right. to the wrong podcast, right? Um, but it was sort of it was definitely like seeing because um, I had I, I had gone to some libertarian club meetings in, in college because a friend from high school went to the same college and was running the club. And some of it I thought was ridiculous. And some of it I was like, yeah, you know, I had a problem with authority growing up with just like my parents and in school. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's just this sort of like, you know, being your own person, like, screw, screw the big guy. And I felt like I'd heard the left argument, which is my parents like liberalism, which really was no argument, which is just sort of like what the, you know, this is what you're supposed to like, this is that they sort of really they're very clear party line uh, democratic voters and didn't really give much thought besides that. Um, but so I felt like I'd heard both sides and right. because it's so unsu unsu unsubstantive, um, at least my, you know, the liberalism I was experiencing. Yeah. Your um, parents, your parents were are, are partisans and you were, uh, yeah. and, 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 and they, and their partisanship was also functioning as, one like uh side of what uh, presumably uh, appeared as ideological and that just empty partisanship uh without any type of ideology uh behind it um does not stack up well against a, a different ideology because there's no it, it is all just assertions <laughs> essentially i mean um and so you, you, there's a lot more thought that can go into an ideology, even one that is, um, you know, bad 
uh, for lack of a better, you know, more nuanced term than one that is just sort of doesn't, doesn't seem to even have any structure. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes like the, the media, the right wing media seem like what you needed was an uncle or an aunt who was <laughs> like a leftist or at the very least, like had some type of ideology, uh, some type of reason to vote for a Democrat or whatever it is. Um, yeah. And the only people in my family who ever seem to think or discuss politics in like the broader, more extended family was, it was very much uh, sort of like people who now are further right more openly, who are like, you know, that are, you know, stop the steal people now and like, you know, double Trump voters. But, you know, and previously it's like they have the gay wedding cake debate, right? Right. Which is just a perfect example of when your libertarian debate sort of just, it's just like, it's like you can hear that and be like, yeah, like it should be your choice. It's your place. And then when you, when you're like, when you just compare it very directly, it's like, so you're, you're against like the civil rights act. And it's like, well, no, but wait, like, it's just sort of, it falls apart immediately under the first little bit of scrutiny, but it sounds like it's so easy to construct the argument from a, from a place that makes you feel like I've thought about it and I have principles and beliefs. And this is how, like, it, it, it's sort of, it just really um, well, it's also, appealed to like the insecurity. It, it, and, it's also uh, why it's very popular, you know, with, with, with frankly, with young men uh, who, yeah. you know, and if you get, and, and also the way it's interesting too, the way that they all do stay in their little universe of like, we're all just going to go to our circle jerk, uh, you know, appeal on each other's uh, podcast and reinforce everything and create this notion of like, this is the, uh, epistem uh, uh, what is it? The epistemological uh, circle that we're going to create here, and then if you find yourself in there, everything looks uh, right. Well, listen. Um, thank you for calling in. It's really interesting to hear uh, from uh, from from folks like you. I would also recommend if you only came to this show late. How did you come to this show? Um, I think it was. I think it was legitimately through just sort of watching uh like debate content again when I, I i got furloughed at the beginning of covid and just had a bunch of free time so i just sort of am like scrolling the you know i think i just came across a debate video uh and it was like a it, like i think it must have had like debating a libertarian in the title because i'm sure i was just consuming i used to just like put on debate like you know long political debates or you know way way back you know like atheist theist debates but um i i genuinely think it was just a random uh recommendation because i was specifically looking for like uh, more content like that of like the you know the owning uh the the, the, the opponent type thing because and i i don't know it just it was like enough of uh relevance in two different categories i guess well but just the the very the very last thing i if, if go, go I, i'm not gonna go longer but just because the point you brought up about like creating their own little uh universe where everything seems right inside there i felt that like that was actually true socially like i felt like it reinforced itself because it tells me that like i can't talk about this with my friends who are on the left because they'll reject me it's like the cancel culture like fear but then which i think is why it's more easy to get people who are socially isolated but it's like i had good friends who were more to the left than me who would have discussions with me when I would espouse more right-leaning opinions. And it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, they immediately think I'm a bad person. It's like, but I, I can imagine if you don't have a lot of social connections, you might be like terrified that that's like a stigma that'll keep you from making friends, especially in college. And that sort of reinforces only seeking out the, that like little tight knit group, even in real life. Yeah. Interesting. Well, stay in touch. Uh, I would recommend that you go and uh, watch some uh, Michael um, uh, Brooks stuff. Uh, oh, absolutely! You know, I, absolutely, it's not, yeah. I found CMBS through your show as well, and I oh great, I'm a huge. Uh, All right, man. Well, thanks for the call. Fan, so. uh, don't be a stranger. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Thanks. Bye. All right, we got time for for one more call. Call from a uh, f well. We have time for more calls later, but I'm um, saying in this little. Segment window, of yeah. little window. Call him from a four one seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 
Hi, this is Gene from Springfield, Missouri. How are Gene, you doing? Gene, how are you? Nice to hear from you. Nice to hear, to hear you too. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment about to today's de uh, guest, and in particular, uh, the kind of underlying arguments that seem to sort of, uh, seem, which his sort of whole premise is based on. And it seems to be a kind of rehashing of this uh, pseudo class analysis which is being forwarded on the political right and which is being taken up on the uh, by some elements of the left, which relates to this kind of professional managerial class elite and this terminology, which posits individuals with education as cosmopolitan and not really working class. And sort of when they when they talk about class, they're really about someone's educational level rather than the more traditional understanding of class which is kind of a, um, you know, which is based on your objective uh, relationship to, to the economy. So, you know, today in America's economy, you know, uh, credentials are, uh, are required for a number of jobs, which are objectively speaking, working class. But we see a kind of through line on the political right, going back to someone like James Burnham, who wrote The Managerial Revolution, a former Trotskyist who ended up working for the National Review, who sort of recast class politics as a cultural war. Right. And I think this was a kind of da dangerous discourse for the left to engage in. Not that all of the observations are sort of incorrect. I think sometimes, uh, you know, one has to be careful when dealing with a highly emotional issue such as nationality and sort of people's national sentiments. But capitulating to sort of nationalist arguments, I think is ultimately a dead end. You know, uh, the British Labour Party sort of it, it typifies this in two ways. In one sense, under Corbyn, there were some unnecessary battles fought over the issue of nationality and not the ones that he, he, he cited, which was giving EU people the right to vote, but something like decolonizing uh, the, the, the syllabus. You don't need to advertise that at the forefront of your manifesto and trigger a backlash you just appoint good historians to help you know write a better national curriculum once you're in power but on the flip side since corbyn's defeat you've had a lot of flag waving on the labor party and people people don't buy it so you know you have to be careful with this kind of discourse but i think sort of c capitulating to this this pseudo class analysis which which is really just culture wars dressed up I as class analysis it is becoming increasingly clear that that we're getting a lot of this, um, and and you know I don't want to get uh, I don't want to get uh, too you know too deep into this in, in regards to this guy, but it, but I there you know uh, I, I it has been something he is someone whose whose positions I think about a lot, and I have begun to sort of like see this uh, you know that is becoming uh, uh, clear to me that the. You know, like, and, and we're like hearing this almost like, you know, for like this is like where, where Greenwald in my mind is coming from in a lot of respects. It, what is being waged by whatever that, 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 that crew is, is very much a cultural war. I mean, um, uh, that there, it's just that it's done in the, the, the culture war is just done in a slightly different, the terminology is slightly different, but yes, I agree with you. If you're an adjunct, uh, uh, you know, adjunct professor, like, I'm sorry, you are not part, you're not a PMC, or maybe you are from a technical standpoint, but, um, a, a, in terms of your relationship, like you say, to the economy, you're not making any money. Um, and you have no uh, economic power in the system. And frankly, there's not a lot of opportunity for you to move up uh, into, into that system. And that's just a, a reality. But yet in the framing of, 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 of Judas's, you would be one of these rootless cosmopolitans, um, you know, arguably. And, I, and I, 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 I agree. I think that's a very good, um, I think that's a good, assessment and i you know the 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 populism and the right wing populism that gets sort of misclassified as as socialist i think is also sort of a a, a function of this because it really is um it is fetishizing a um 
I mean, it's, it really is. I mean, it's culture war, but it's a, it's an aesthetic too, on some level, I think. Um, but yeah. And, and it's not a particularly new phenomenon. If you go back to conservatism of the 19th century, uh, you know, conservatives like Benjamin Disraeli would uh, sort of foe a kind of care about the working class and talk about how the evil capitalists are not caring for the working class to support a more conservative faction of the British ruling class, just as today conservatives are trying to uh, make the argument that there's all these eggheads who are running everything, and the vigorous capitalists and the hard workers should be in alliance against these kind of uh, eggheads. It's a kind of uh, it's it's an insidious politics, which is, you know today is represented by figures like Michael Lind. You know you see it in the work of Andrew, Angela Nagel. And people like that, and I think it's really important when when you hear the right wing populists talk about class, be very careful in understanding what they are talking about because they're not necessarily meaning the same thing that you think that they're meaning. So obviously, this kind of discourse is precisely how the political right and the far right is attempting to smuggle in uh, right wing politics to those who've been disaffected by, you know, the failure of the Bernie Sanders movement and, you know, the, the seeming sort of hegemonic liberalism and the kind of great awakening which divorces kind of issues of racial justice from ra- issues of economic justice. And so this kind of sort of, they, they, they kind of come, come in with this pseudo-class analysis to try to win you over to their uh, side of class one. I think it's, that was kind of the main point that I just had to call in. Not that I want to sort of specifically hammer on this guest, but that, you know, I, I do see this kind of uh, discourse being espoused by a number of, uh, you know, boomer age ex-communists who, have, you know, have gravitated towards the political right uh, over the years. Where do you think like a guy like Tucker Carlson fits in in that equation? I mean, I think I think Tucker Carlson is an opportunist. I, I think I think right. he's a very astute uh, uh, political op. He manages he managed to sort of navigate his way through the Bush era, sort of uh, aligning with the Bush sort of wing. But I think he has a good sense of where the political wind is blowing. And you know, I think his political project at the end of the day is a conservative pol- political project, and the, the language of pseudo class politics sort of what we might call national conservatism as opposed to the more cosmopolitan sort of, um, uh, po- you know, post, uh, you know, post fall of communism, uh, 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 conservatism, which kind of dominated the Republican establishment. I think, you know, he, 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 he realizes that uh, a lot of the old tropes don't work anymore. We're in a post-Cold War era and, you know, uh, the, the, the old conservative project doesn't really have much popular buy-in. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the Republicans have to build a political coalition, don't they? And to, to win elections, they have to at least get a slice of, you know, the, the working class. Some of that is mobilized around grievances, and some of that is ro- uh, uh, mobilized around sort of, um, you know, fear about, the traditional position of men in society. And, you know, it, you can wrap this all up in a kind of class war against a liberal political elite, which seems, you know, which is objectively speaking quite detached from the population. It's not that, you know, the conservative political elite is so close to the population as well. But, you know, they can cosplay this populism. And I see it in small town uh, Missouri. You know, you, you have people who go around, you know, wearing camo and you know with guns slung over their back but they're like factory owners you know and so they cosplay a kind of down with the people radicalism which is framed in cultural terms so when you say working class they're not thinking the the, the image that comes to your mind isn't some uh, latino woman who is uh, you know, cleaning toilets but it's some you know muscly hunky man uh, in a steel mill right so, yeah, I just think I just felt that, you know, with the, the guest today, that was the kind of political trap. And I'm sure he's very sincere. I don't want to criticize him on a personal level. But I see I see this kind of sort of cultural class politics as opposed to sort of actual class politics uh, seeping into the uh, certain elements of the political left with this whole post left movement 
of, of people, you know, you have publications like the Bellows, which are in many ways often sort of funded in terms of their funded, funding streams by figures on the political right, uh, right who kind of uh, want to see these splits on the on the left. Right. And, 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 and also, I want to be clear about this, too, that like um, the, the 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 conflation of of you know, a class politics and, and cultural politics is, is, is problematic there. We could very well have, I mean, fr from a left perspective, like, you know, there is, there are cultural politics. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm frankly convinced that most of our politics in this country uh, increasingly are, are driven by culture, <laughs> you know, and, um, or at least, you know, uh, sort of like, you know, what, what we, you know, are, are, are driven by uh, cultural incentives uh, for a, a huge number of people who, who vote. I mean, that, that kid we just called in, his parents, they, you know, a lot of what they're, they're voting on is, you know, sort of like a, a cultural response. It's certainly the case on the right too, I think. Um, and so it's just for uh, when they start to slice off those, um, and they start to slice off these, you know, uh, slight cohorts to uh, expand their coalition. They dress it up as something different. And uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know that that's what what Judas is doing, but I think it's just sort of like, you know, which one are you saying that it, it that that immigrants triggers a certain, um, you know, fires certain synapses in, um, you know. G g certain people's brains and so they vote for Republicans? Or are you saying that like there is a policy argument against this? Uh, you know, I, I, that's, and, and then, you know, uh, that policy argument, how does that fit into an ideological frame? And we couldn't quite get there. Uh, and I, I, and I wonder if, I, I, you know, I wonder why that is. I mean, I think it's a seductive type of politics yep. for, for sure, because, you know, making cu cultural appeals is very, you know, you, you appeal to kind of visceral emotions. You know, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, other kinds of sort of more economics and more policy-driven debates, those can be quite boring, you know, and that's like a difficult sell to people, right? As opposed to, you know, just appealing to people's sort of already existent uh, cultural prejudices. And I think because the United States you know, doesn't even have a tradition of the Labour Party. A lot of the politics is uh, culture first, in the sense that you have a culture, uh, you have a conflict. Uh, there's, a, there's a there's a there's a political theorist called um, John Hutchinson who writes about nationalism, and he calls nations zones of, uh, zones of conflict. And what he means is that a lot of politics that takes place are not often based on very substantive differences in policy, but rather on the cultures and uh, the sort of cultural symbols and ideas which embody the national ideal. So there's a fight over what it means to be American. So liberals have one perception of what it is to be American. Conservatives have another perception. And a lot of the fights takes place in the cultural realm when, uh, when in turn on policy, the, the, the differences aren't as stark as are being portrayed in the uh, you know in, in the kind of cultural superstructure and the sort of political dis discourse. I mean, just consider the contradiction between the notion that the Repub you know the notion forwarded by Democrats that the Republican Party is an existential threat to democracy, while at the same time the sort of uh, the, the desire to reach across the aisle and find some kind of bipartisanship. That is not uh, that is a sort of not uh, a coherent approach to politics right no. but it kind of reflects the, the the sort of tension between sort of policy and cultural wars that take place in american politics in my opinion that's you know that's what i would take away from that yeah and that's a particular problem with with the democrats right because um the, it is part of the cultural vision that they're trying to sell uh that um you know we compromise and we reach across and uh, this process is important but uh, the they cannot seem to um accept that there is and you know by they we're really talking about the sort of the, the uh, you know on the margins anyways um that that there is 
this can be threatened to the point where you need to react to it on some level. I think on the um, on the right, to the extent that there is any uh, sort of desire for for unity, is really for homogeneity. Uh, homode homogeneity. Um, uh, Gene, thanks for the call. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Can I plug something really quickly? Of course. Okay, so yeah, can I plug uh, This Is Revolution podcast with uh, Jason Miles and Pascal Robert. It is not my podcast, as uh, Matthew Film Guy uh, declared last week on uh, on The Majority Report, but uh, I do turn it up on Thursday nights when we do our foreign policy show. So uh, yeah, uh, people should check that out. Uh, Pascal Robert, my co-host, has a new piece in Black Agenda Report uh, about the Great Awakening, so people should check that out. Thanks so much, Sam. All right. We, uh, let's put a link uh, to that uh, in the uh, podcast description today. Appreciate it, Gene. Um, let's listen to what AOC says, shall we? Emma? You mean that sellout? Let's listen to what AOC, that sellout, says uh, on Chris Hayes last night about uh, uh, Joe Manchin uh, and his concept of bipartisanship is that HR1 stands up against lobbyists and dark money. And I would reckon to think that this is probably just as much a part of Joe Manchin's calculus as anything else. Because when it comes to this bipartisan argument, I got to tell you, I don't buy it. Because Joe Manchin has voted for bills that have not been bipartisan before. Look at the American Rescue Plan. So this is not just about bipartisanship. This is, I think, because you look at the Koch brothers and you look at, you know, organizations like the Heritage Foundation and conservative uh, lobby groups that are doing a victory lap, claiming victory over the fact that Manchin refuses to change on the filibuster. And I think that these two things are very closely intertwined. And I think that there's a desire to make this just about protecting the franchise, but protecting our democracy mm -hmm. is also about making sure that we give lobbyists and dark money groups, which are funding these attacks on the right to vote, the boot. But, you know, corporate money has a very, very tight grip on both parties. Um, and I think that that has part to, I think that has to do with the calculus in this situation that people aren't really discussing enough. She's totally right. I mean, I mean, and frankly, we've been saying this for weeks, uh, and, and particularly if folks, uh, you know, listen to um, uh, Digby and I on the on the Peacock show, and when she's come here, the Joe Manchin's been signaling this for 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 months. He has a problem with the For the People Act versus the um, uh, the John Lewis uh, uh, thing, and and the. There, there's other differences, certainly, but the primary difference is the disclosure stuff about the money and big money. And that is what that is what it has been about for Joe Manchin. That's why he wants to kill that. That's one of the reasons why he doesn't want the filibuster gone, because he doesn't want that thing to pass. And that's it. I mean, of course, she's absolutely right. And good for her for our, you know, um, for for for, you know, saying that in, in public, because you're not going to get a lot of Democrats who are going to sort of accuse him of being completely disingenuous. And he is. well, they're, they're not going to do it because there are a number of Democrats who are in that same boat as him, even if they're posturing publicly that they want um, they're in favor of the For the People Act or that more specifically, they would be in favor of filibuster reform. There is a lot of fear uh amongst these old school democrats about what that would mean um and one of the things that it would mean would be that they'd have to grapple with election reform and joe manchin senators like mark warner they're bankrolled by dark money and industries that they don't necessarily want being disclosed or hampered and uh that's the reality of it and I loved what she said there. Um, she seemed to follow Jamal Bowman's, uh, I think, position and and ta talking points there. Not not exactly, but 
they're trying to tie Manchin to corruption and to the Republicans. And I don't know how much that helps move the needle on this conversation for his purposes. Maybe he likes it. I don't really know. Um, but it seems like at least there's some coordination from House progressives in how to respond to this. Yeah, I don't know that it helps, but I don't know that there is a help. I don't know that there can be anything to um, uh, move. Uh, so what would be nice is if you had a for the people act and then eventually Democrats like Joe Manchin, well, maybe he'd still be in office, but you'd have more Democrats who are beholden to the people who would make his, you know, complete posture moot. Yeah. Hope springs eternal. Um, let's uh, check in on Louis Gohmert. Been a long time since we heard from him. Uh, he is at the House Natural Resources hearing. Um, is uh, marijuana now legal in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Well, and uh, I imagine if you were working in the Capitol, you probably wouldn't be smoking or vaping. You'd probably be eating. Uh, I don't know why I ask. I don't, I don't know why I bring that up. But here is uh, Louis Gomer. And I understand from what's been testified to the Forest Service and the BLM, you want very much to uh, work on the issue of climate change. I was uh, uh, informed by the immediate past director of NASA that they have found that the moon's orbit is changing slightly, and so is the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, we know there's been a significant solar flare activity. Um, and so is there anything that the National Forest Service or BLM can do to uh, change the course of the moon's orbit or the Earth's orbit around the sun? Obviously, that would have profound effects on our climate. I would have to follow up with you on that one, Mr. Gomert. Yeah. Well, if you figure out a way that you in the uh, Forest Service can make that change, I'd like to know. Uh, also, just to uh, put on. Is he lost his mind? I mean, do you think he was being sarcastic in some way? No. Oh, that was very dry humor. Well, wait a second. Now, let me try and give him the benefit of the doubt. Forest Service, you grow super, super big trees. You find like some, you do some hybrid tree, right? You take like a redwood and then you juice it some way. So if the tree gets so big, it like, it, and you got to plant a bunch of them. I'm not just saying one big tree. I'm saying a whole bunch of super, super big trees, heavy trees, dense trees. You want them fast growing too. So maybe you would like hybrid, like a, like a white pine, which grows fast and a redwood, which is like big. And then maybe like a heavy tree, maybe like put a little apple in there. Or, or oh, stop maple. showing off. We know you and, know trees. And then it, they grow so big and you plant them all in one area of the country so that it tilts the earth a little bit and changes. How that would have a very in. minor effect on, yeah, the orbits. I right? mean, I, I would probably, if you, if changing the orbit is, you know, the goal, I'd probably use it like nuclear weapons or something. But I don't know why. why do we know why this is a goal? Well, to me, this is my guess, right? So. Oh, it's climate change denial stuff, of course. Yes. Yeah, well, he's saying that climate change is a function of the planets. And therefore, the uh, Bureau of Land Management, and the Forestry Service, they can't do anything about it unless they can grow super, super, du super duper trees. He is appealing to the Alex Jones conspiracy wing that thinks that the government's controlling the weather. Like that's, uh, I think that's the vein. Of well, yeah, I mean the solar flares. I mean, I, I just remembered his solar flares thing, which that is a classic climate change denial thing is, oh, we're, it's just hot because there's all these solar flares now. But I, yeah, it is hard. To, I don't understand the orbit, but. I mean, I think, I, I don't think he was joking. I think he is trying to get them on the record in case, you know, the liberal scientists, they get way too big for their britches and they try to change the rotation 
of the of moon the and sun and the planet i mean why not well it, it, they said that our it's our um uh rotation around the uh the sun i think he said which i uh, look the tricky part is growing the tree fast enough but i wouldn't that can take thousands of years yeah I mean, it could take, we'd have to get an accelerated. That's why you, you mix it in with the white pine. You have to create some sort of Frankenstein tree. Or, or you, you don't worry about the tree being so heavy because you put a bunch of weights on it when it's smaller. And as it grows higher, the weight will all be on the top of the tree and lean things over just a little bit. Yeah, I, I wonder what kind of weights, like you would have to make sure that the trunk of the tree could sustain it even as it grows. Yeah, yeah, it's that's tricky. Difficult, it's tricky, right? I'm not a scientist. So but human, just, that's what I would to be honest, there. like human and maybe the Bureau of Land Management, if they have like control over dams or something, you can alter the, spin of the globe with those things so uh he's not as clever as he thinks he is i just don't know why if we didn't want to do that we wouldn't get a really long rope tied around the moon and then tie it to the earth and then you could just kind of control it and shift it a little bit that seems like an easier more efficient way to to to, to figure this out yeah or if superman was real he could just do it. So it's too bad. We missed, we missed the boat on that one. Folks, um, as you know, Mo Brooks uh, from Alabama uh, has been sued, or, or I guess his uh, wife. No, no, no. Uh, he's he's sued by Eric no, sued. Uh, Eric sued. Swalwell. Yeah. Uh, Eric Swalwell is, um, is uh, suing him for the incitement uh during that led up to the january 6th insurrection and apparently mo brooks claimed that he wasn't hiding from <laughs> slawell's attorney uh so that he couldn't be served with um the um subpoena and uh apparently uh mrs mo brooks was uh, also served and here is uh here's how that went down We got no audio here, so let's narrate it. This okay. is Mo Brooks's home. We got okay. a car pulling up. That is their, um, uh, their you know, outdoor camera. And here comes the subpoena guy running in. Hi, I'm just here to run in. It's raining. I'm here really super quick. Hey, yeah. hey. Uh, uh, he's, this. So he, he followed her in. Into right? the garage, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And now this Karen, She's mad. oh my goodness. I'm just doing my job, lady. I mean, that God. is, can I just say like, people can just run in your garage and serve you a subpoena. Uh, Wait, so now she's trying to block him. Okay, well, well that was very Better be careful because the Republicans have uh, decreased liabilities for stuff like that. And yeah. thank you to <laughs> th right, thank you to the Brooks uh, family for releasing the security footage from their home so that we have proof that she was officially served. Yeah. It was very uh, helpful. Very helpful. I, um, well, I haven't talked about this, but I got sued recently. Um, it's been resolved now. I got sued for a um, picture that we had on a YouTube thumbnail uh, from like four or five years ago. It's crazy. Uh, it cost an enormous amount of money. We accidentally took something that was apparently like copyrighted. That video probably made $25. Uh, and it cost uh, five, uh, five figures to uh, settle. Um, and I kept thinking like, am I going to get like a, I, I had it on a Google alert. It came across like, that's how I saw. It. And the, you know, I kept thinking like, oh, I won't get served. I won't get served. But they were able to do it, um, you know, through our, uh, our corporation that is, we're incorporated, um, the business entity. 
Um, and they were able to do it directly through the secretary of state, you know, I guess during COVID might've been easier, but I was like, I kept looking around always for the person who was going to serve me, you know, when I got closer to the date. Uh, and I, I don't know what I would have done, run away or something like that, but well, yeah, I mean, it didn't work out. You wouldn't have s stood behind the car though, to prevent that car I might from, have, I might have said, you're not leaving this property, buddy. Till you take this subpoena back. Take it back till you turn back time. Yeah. Well, there that, you go. That sucks, Sam. That's that's not right. Uh there are there are um what do they call them? There were uh there is sort of like uh copyright trolls and uh lawyers who go through, sift through, try and find this stuff. Some some dude, I uh, you know, they didn't you know, they, they didn't even try and settle uh really in any way they just took uh took me to court um and then i just uh didn't contest it it ended up being the cheapest way to go but sam uh before we move on what do you think about the strategy by eric swalwell i mean i it's just I, like a little bit up your own ass <laughs> yeah i mean i think that like you know the Democrats should go ahead with a commission and get this get this done. But I, I also think that you go into discovery and he's doing it because he has standing. Like we don't have standing to bring this suit. This is a suit that only a, I believe, I mean, it, it's conceivable that like a, a Capitol police officer could or mm -hmm. a staffer could, because they were subjected to uh, to this. I think he's just doing it as a private citizen. Like I was in this uh, place, I uh, you know w suffered the this 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 fear, and uh, he was involved in inciting it. And there could be things that Swalwell thinks exist through discovery that could come out, right? Like I don't think if Slaw well, let's put it this way, if Swalwell settles, <laughs> then there would be a problem, you know. And that's and my concern. I mean, uh, yeah, it, just, it seems unlikely to me. It, okay. I, I think what this is about is get things into discovery that you can't get in other ways, um, and that means like maybe you know, like uh, for instance, if in the lawsuit about the copyright. If we had gone in there, all of my communication, they would have had access to all of my communication with everybody on the staff. They could have combed through all of my emails, all of my, you know, texts to see if like, I don't know, I purposely, you know, use this copyrighted material or something. I don't know. Um, and that in and of itself was part of the reason why I settled. I was like, I don't want to pay for this audit that they're going to have to do. It's thousands of dollars. Um, it's, that is, you know, that could be part of it. I, I'll give you a better assessment later. I mean, I'm not, you know, Swalwell's not my. No, I think, I mean, when part. you say that, that if, if that's what it is, I'm in favor of it. I'm just kind of lukewarm about whatever, what I, I, I'm having a hard time gleaning what the, the, the larger what the ends are. What if the if ends this are, is yeah. the ends, if the lawsuit is the ends of something, then I would say it's silly. But if it's a means in which to get information that ultimately become um, you know, part of hearings or whatnot, then I think it becomes much more prominent. Um, I, I would be suing others too if I was uh, him, but I don't know exactly why they went with Mo Brooks. I mean, no, there's more people in the lawsuit. I think Trump oh, there included. Is? Yeah. Okay, that, yeah, I think that, I, I think it has value in that regard. And he's probably doing it because a, he's a former prosecutor. B, he has standing, and he also, I think, you know, has aspirations. Uh, and you know, who knows what he's sending out on his email list about this? But that's, you know, that's part of it. Um, should we play this Canadian rapper, folks? There's people who have been who've called into this program over the years, and. Um, they uh, they have mixed things to say about Canada. Uh, you know, we have uh, 
you know, we have our, our, our preconceived notions of Canadians. Uh, certainly, I have some resent as they have come in and uh, sort of like the guest today said, they took a lot of comedy jobs for many years. That was a problem. Um, but now they're moving in on the conservative rap scene. So there's a lot of conservative rappers who are probably a little miffed by this guy. Uh, but he, um, he's got a uh, Ben Shapiro inspired rap about cancel culture. And it's called Snowflakes. Watch out, Drake. If you lie to the government, they'll put you in prison. But when they lie to all of us, it's called being a politician. You think taking guns away will save our kids from the killings? But your pro-choice abortion kills way more children. If America's so terrible and racist, it probably isn't safe to encourage immigration. Just saying, all the contradictions are embarrassing. You know who hates America the most? Americans. Trigger warnings used to be on TV for seizures. And now they're everywhere to protect millennials' feelings. He, she, his, him, hers, them, they. Screw a pronoun. Because everyone's a retard these days. Here a breach. Ooh, really, really nice. I like the I like the um the sign that says Tom equals trash in the background. Like this guy's named Tom, right? Tom McDonald. Oh. Um is that his rap name? Yeah, I I mean I, I that's not a rap name guy. You got you got Tommy Mac or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean he he couldn't come up with it, but um, real cringe there. I guess that's him being canceled when someone calls him trash. Let's talk about snowflakes. A little bit snowflakey. I also think like you know Canadians have no business coming around telling us about our country. You know we're not. When will you imagine if uh, an American just did a, like a critique of canada through a rap i would i would actually i would love to see that that would be fantastic was that all we had of that oh no it's a almost four minute uh long song <laughs> let's watch a little bit more let's watch a little more very really fascinating there's a race war here, elections based on fear. Black lives only matter once every four years. Soldiers died for this country and every one of us benefits. Give welfare to the bums and forget about the veterans. Black folks and white folks divided by the news. But we are all the same. We are red, white, and blue. Ashamed to be American? Okay, that's cool. Because honestly, we are all ashamed of you too. Who is Wait, we? Who is we? Fake. Oh no, the forecast said that is this I guy don't Canadian? want these. I don't want is he these. Actually, Canadian. Wow, how does he get off doing all this? Yeah, I, yeah. There's like part of the article that I sent you. In the I, I mean, I I don't I don't understand why these Canadian foreigners are coming into our country and taking all of our conservative hip hop jobs. It's really unbelievable. Continue to play. Yeah, I know. <laughs> too good. It's number. I, four. We got to the chorus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to hear the chorus? I want to hear the chorus. Stop denying yeah. us. Like, it's oh, number it's four on YouTube right now in terms of trending on music. And it has. More flames. Oh, no. No more snowflakes. They set us up to fail. That's what they built the system for. Put an ammunition shop across the street from a liquor store. Empowering women used to be different than this before. The role models got OnlyFans or dance on a stripper pole. Screw it. I ain't tripping. I don't mean to be mean. But if our children are the future, then our future is bleak. They take an Adderall to focus, hit McDonald's to eat. They're addicted to phones and they take Xanax to sleep. They blurred the lines dividing communism and democracy. In 2021, we paint the patriots as Nazis. The men playing women's sports get trophies for winning. Like, great, let's celebrate a man for beating some women. If you're black, your life matters. You're supposed to embrace it. If you're rich or you're smart, then you're probably Asian. If you're gay, then you're brave. All of that I'm okay with. But if you're white, the stereotype is you are a racist. Blaming capitalism like that's the reason things are tough. While you tweet from an iPhone and sip on a Starbucks. You're supporting we what you phones. stand against. You don't think you are, but a Percocet addict don't donate money to pharma. Damn dog, we're all afraid to speak the truth. And the more afraid we get, the more we hate the ones who do. You're ashamed to be American? Okay, that's cool. Cause honestly, we are all ashamed of you too. Y'all are so fake. Oh no. The forecast said that there'd be snowflakes. Pause it. I mean, this is actually <laughs> sort of, but it is, there is something that, I mean, this is sort of fascinating, okay? Because he is, it's the same thing that you see with uh, critical race uh, uh, studies. Like they, the idea that you can 
complain about like sit there and, and you know some of what he's talking about is anti-consumerist right and he's talking about the power of farmers and and well he's very anti-drug but that's all capitalism right exactly Phones. and then and yeah. then he attributes that to some form of communism i mean this is what's sort of like both like sort of very dangerous i mean this is you know an extension on what uh gene was talking about there is a conflation here of of you know the ideology and the the um the naming of the economic system that we're in is he, he's conflating things. I don't know if he's doing it consciously, but it's like um, when you're uh, half the things he's complaining about there are a function of our capitalist society. And uh, consumerism is not a problem with communism. <laughs> I mean, well, no, but it's all it comes back to he thinks he's owning the libs because they talk about socialism and they have iPhones. So it's sort of like. He's attempting to go down a you're a hypocrite road, which of course we know that just because you exist in a society doesn't mean that you're a hypocrite. Um, but then he veers into why are you taking Xanax to sleep? And uh, also communism is bad. Well, yeah, he also, but he does it. He does the, both of them. He also says yeah. like, he makes a critique of addict phone addiction. Like that's, that's not communism. That's capitalism, no. right? <laughs> uh, if our children are the future, then our future is bleak. They are taking Adderall to focus. It hit McDonald's to eat. Now, let's be clear. Uh, I mean, that sounds the, like Macklemore. And then he becomes like, just the, like the, the, Ben Shapiro. The, the why, why do people take Adderall who don't need it? Their they boss, it. They're boss. They're trying to perform at work. They're trying to perform at work or they're trying to perform at, 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 it is because at, at school, because we have a, uh, there's been a, not only a hyper uh, competitive society that we have created, but one where you need a, an advantage just to survive. Hit right. McDonald's to eat all of this addicted to phones, Xanax to sleep. These are all a function of capitalism. Um, and it is an amazing turn that he makes that it's about like the communism and whatnot. Um, and the idea that like, it's okay for you to be gay, but like, you know, white people are not racist. Uh, continue. I mean, I think it's really I, no, I just, no, it, it's just, it, it's the preachiness of like that Macklemore, whatever. Then he has the aesthetic of, you know, some sort of TikTok rapper, but it's all just lazy half baked, well, this is yeah, all turning right point USA you... nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, turn volume down half if you can, Brim. Whoa. You can make us see it your way. No way. Gasoline and pro. More flames. Oh no. No more snowflakes. We can all get along, but there's no stopping. Everybody's wrong, that's a real problem. That's the bridge. They don't want to hear it, but they still talking. Soon enough, we're running out of options. This ain't gonna end till it's in the <laughs> Climate change? We'll be friends till we try to squat. Is this whole song actually about climate change? We can make amends or we drop it. Snowflakes melt when it's hot, kid. Y'all are so fake. Oh no. The forecast said that there be so His style is amazing, Whoa. also. Is this the rest of the chorus? Yeah. They said there would be snowflakes. Whoa. <laughs> Matt, I didn't realize you had that kind of... Uh... I'm going to do a remix, but it's going to be about how we're running out of options on climate change. He st I mean, he said snowflakes melt. Maybe that's it. Wow. You lie to the government, they'll put you in prison. But when they all lie to all of us, it's called being a politician. Whoa, dude. When the that when you lie to what they're gonna put you in prison? If you lie to the government, they'll put you in prison. But when they lie to all of us, it's called being a politician. Well, sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes they when you lie to the government. I mean, if it's in a context of a criminal case that they're trying to yes. <laughs> or you're just a national security. Yeah. Right. Or if you're you're lying on your taxes, but he goes. That, it, 
if America's so terrible and racist, it probably isn't safe to encourage immigration. Just saying, like, yeah, dude, stay on your side of the border. Don't talk about <laughs> exactly. Stay in Vancouver. Well, it's not safe for white rappers. Canada. Yeah, um, well, in Virginia, Terry McAuliffe uh, won uh, won the uh, Democratic primary. Uh, he was not as bad in his first go round as, as people anticipated. And he may be one of those guys who, you know, Virginia is not the, um, uh, the most radical of places, but he could be one of those guys who pushes it forward. Northam has been, uh, you know, not bad, actually, relatively speaking, a lot of enfranchisement of, uh, of, 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 of voters. And, um, but, uh, Picked up a um, a win that was uh, Lee Carter lost his uh, primary. Didn't feel like he was too focused on it. He ended up uh, running for governor, which seems like a I don't know, sort of a, a little bit of a shortcut. You might want to be a state delegate for more than one one uh, one time. But uh, I appreciate his voice. But here's a guy in the Darius Clark, 26 years old. He won his House delegate primary. He defeated a, an incumbent who was uh, bankrolled by an energy company. And uh, here he is. Movement, uh, 20,000 doors now. Uh, this is just truly uh, so remarkable. I'm so happy that I was able to do this to show uh, Virginia that we needed a uh, new representation, that the time is now to make a change. And we did that. Talk to me about the emotion, yes. all the time and effort you've spent. Yes, it's been a long six months, uh, day in and day out, knocking doors, making calls. <laughs> it's just so emotional because I didn't think, you know, this would happen. People like me don't normally get this opportunity to represent their uh, community. So it's just so remarkable that we got the opportunity to do this, to show Virginia that a young 26 year old can make a difference in their community. Um, it's amazing. Uh, very he's 20, exciting. he's 26. I don't know if you said that, Sam. Yep. Community activist, radio host, $15 minimum wage, pro union, pro reparations. Um, one of his top priorities is giving more funding to schools. So, I mean, good politics good politics and seems like a good guy. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's take one more, uh, phone call and then we'll do some IMs calling from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey Sam, it's bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. Bro Flamingo. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, I'm doing pretty good. Just got done working out. Uh, I'm actually pretty hyped because we're going to have our convention, uh, uh, I think our state DSA convention, like between July 9th and 11th. Shout out to the Las Vegas DSA. Love you guys. Um, man, you guys covered so much. I want to I speak about a lot of things, but uh, I think I'll go to two things real quick. Um, you know, I feel like that, like Barack, you guys talked about Barack Obama yesterday, and um you know, you, you had him on uh, on the first on the first part of the show, and it's just really, really interesting to me how, um, you know, he just doesn't really get it, and, and it's and I and I still think there's that kind of strain within within the Democratic Party. Like, like don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's like you know disingenuous disingenuous motives with uh, Joe Manchin, whatever. We, we all know the time is with him in cinema, but I still think there's still like this. Well, they still think, let me say that, they still think there's like this thing where the fever's going to break and, you know, he's speaking his passive voice and, the, and, and um, you know, the Republicans are going to have to have a come to Jesus moment. And I think that it's really toxic to be putting that message out there. Uh, you know, listen, you know, it's, it's, it's okay for Barack Obama, he's going to be okay. But this ideology, I mean, us, we have ideological enemies. You know, he has secret service or whatever. He's gonna, he's a millionaire. He's gonna be good. But these guys, you know, these guys want to say the Republicans, the West Coast, the bad guys. They really are ideological enemies, and he has to be defeated. And, and I think that has to be reiterated time and again. Because I even hear see some leftists. They talk about how, you know, the, the, the Capitol riots, that was a clown show. Trump is defeated, whatever. 
I think Trump may be diminished, but Trumpism is here to stay. And, you know, try, trying to, you know, kind of knock that off the table, or at least diminish the threat of these guys, you know, it's very, very dangerous. And having this passive voice and being passive about it, I think it's, it's, it's very toxic to anything we're trying to do. And it's, try, it's trying to stop the energy, basically. You know, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I agree with you. Um, I, and I, I am not one of those people who thinks that the Trumpism is going to go away. I, I uh, do not have faith that Marco Rubio is going to be some type of, uh, you know, I, I, I remember Marco Rubio uh, abandoning immigration reform. I mean, this guy, it, there, there's no, um, for Marco Rubio to change, let's say, just as an example, um, the, the Republican Party themselves would have to change. And, and the, there was no change in, a, in, in becoming Trumpist. It was, a, um, it was simply the next step on a journey they have been on for 20, more, 20 at least 20 years, more. And, and so it, it wasn't, uh, nobody converted into Trumpism. Everybody just sort of like slid right in. Maybe there'll be a different set of, uh, of policies that a Marco Rubio would support. But at the end of the day, you know, these guys sh all showed what they're willing to do in the right uh, context. But uh, oh, also, Sam, to, to your point, actually, because I, I wanted to, I want to talk about the second thing real quick. Now, jump is that Michael Judas talked about you know the Republicans if, if Trump is defeated, or I think say Trump, but you know twenty 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 two and twenty twenty four are very critical, and they think they're going to they're going to pivot to Marco Rubio. That was an interesting interview, at because to me that, that that's fantastical thinking. Yeah, I agree. You know, yeah, and um, and, and the thing is too, I, I think the more the more correct thing to say is like, look, I think to to be honest, I think Trump has a shelf life. You know, and I think where I think where Michael kind of lost the plot is like, you know, where Trump may may be defeated. Like, for example, it, it, let's just say the Democrats win or the left wins in, in 2022. Right. Trump may be defeated. But but the Trumpism, you know, like the, the lunatics, the white supremacists, they're here to stay. So 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 the Republicans might be the calculation. Like, look, and, and by the way, if he is defeated. Right. I'm, I'm sure there won't be any love lost. Like, oh, we could finally get rid of this idiot and just keep the white supremacy and just keep keep the psychopathic massage and, you know, on all the garbage that, you know, activates the base. But, you know, again, very dangerous thinking. To play, well, dangerous, but very, very very fantastic and I think it's dangerous because at the end of the day, again, he might feel comfortable or whatever, but there's also people of color and women that would argue, I mean, it's debatable, but they've been living under fascism for a very long time. You get know what I'm yep, saying? Like, yep. you know, anyways, guys, love what you do. Let's you best. Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for the call. All right. Let's read some IMs, shall we? Yes. Zephi, uh, regarding the 26-year-old that just won his delegate race, he said it was a six-month journey, meaning he started his campaign relatively early in the cycle to all aspiring challenges. Start your campaigns early. Indeed, cog in the capitalist machine, longtime listener, first-time commenter. Very happy with the diversity of guests you've had on lately. Thank you. Uh, of all of Tom McDonald's scathing one-liners, says left Lishoning, Lichoning. Um, scathing one-liners are just TPUSA talking points. Conservative quips sound smart, but instantly fall apart the moment somebody isn't arguing against an imagined snowflake. It's part of a project to rebrand standard conservatism as edgy counterculture. Yes, that is called uh, reaction, uh, uh, you know, the reactionary mind. We see this all, this happens all the time. They do this every couple of years. They do this every couple of years. Um, All right. Bottom structure. Right wing populists will continue to vote for the establishment party on the basis of even if it's not who I want, I, can, I still can't let the other team win. Whereas left wing populists will either sit out an election or vote their conscience on a third party. Yes, I agree. We shouldn't let immigrants into the country because it breaks down our national social safety nets and weakens our labor. But it's not the fault of the capitalist business owners for giving up on their national spirit to hire the immigrant for lower wages. Good point, da, uh, dude, guy, pal. I'm usually uh, one. I'm not usually one to complain about first half guest, but holy shit, where'd you find this clown, Sam? He's actually, 
he's, he's well known, like sort of long time writer about this stuff. Columbia <laughs> University. The Tim Caucus, I'm going to need to disagree with your guest about the notion Biden has adopted populist style politics. I don't think he said populist. I think he said nationalist. He said, I mean, he also said that him and Warren were oh, yeah. socialists light, basically. I mean, if, if you assume that Biden was, um, uh, if you just assume for the moment that Biden could pass everything he's proposed, that would be, I would, you know, within the context of American politics, socialistic. 10,000 versus 50,000. I think it should be 50,000. Um, you know, free community college, uh, the public option. I mean, the PRO Act, definitely. The PRO Act. Um, the, you know, I mean, the, there's the, his, you know, it, it's not going to happen. And I don't know if he was sincere about it, but it's certainly relative, let's say, to Bill Clinton. Well, and and whether I, I'm talking, Bill Clinton aspirational. Yes. I'm talking Bill Clinton getting everything he would want. Yes. I mean, short of, I guess, Hillary care. Well, and whether he's sincere or not, it reflects the need and the desire for it that is be, it, it's exactly. being registered. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection of what, what, what the country is, is, is demanding on some level. Um, Sam's, Sam, oh, Sam Schmieder. Um, Problem is that internationalism has become synonymous with global finance and military adventurism, as opposed to solidarity amongst uh, organizations working people to their common benefit. In that political environment, of course, the elites are going to be the much maligned globalists. And if you want to get support from common people or from regional non-elite capitalists, in Trump's case, you need to brand yourself a nationalist. But there's nothing inherent or natural to that alignment. Treating it as an unchangeable fact suits the interests of the globalists just fine. Yeah, I, that's what I was trying to get at in terms of like, you know, are, we, are you just saying like the, the current politics or what? His point about increasing legal immigration while increasing immigration enforcement, fixing the issue makes no sense. Corporations' money will fall freely no matter what. Ford can still keep manufacturing cars in Mexico, save labor costs. Workers here and there will have no recourse to be at each other's throats. This guy just reinvented NAFTA. Vince Foster, is your guest today a historian? Because he didn't seem to be... Any, grounded in any uh, context in his points. I mean, to say there's a, a malady on the left because Democratic politicians are, are argue to offer free health care to all people in the U.S. when arguing for national health care doesn't make sense outside of a second or third order political argument. Could be a nationalist argument to offer health care to everyone in the country. It's more cost efficient, effective that way. Also, the idea that Trump's Operation War Speed was novel and the way federal dollars were pumped into the pharmaceutical sector is laughable and typical lib both sides statement. It's not grounded in reality or the historical world. Sally screen name. Wow, this guest is full of shit. Holy shit, I'm a union lawyer in the manufacturing sector and that's absolutely false recompetition with immigrants. This guy is full of shit. Trombone guy, who is this idiot? He's also <laughs> lying about Canada. You can book a preventative exam with your doctor anytime you want. Garden socialist, I think y'all know I won't be the only saying, but this guest was a joke. He just kept saying exclusion is necessary for a welfare state democracy and never giving any evidence. Zephi, Mr. Judas's interviews is a reminder why we need more young people in politics, which means more young people voting. Look to Pittsburgh's most recent election. Justin, I figured out from the interview, it's nationally that I hate and it's an effing bad thing, not good and especially not to be worshipped. Also just had bariatric surgery. It was a success. Can I get a shofar? Yes. Congratulations. All right, 10 more and then we're out of here. Uh, train boy, Michael Brooks is rolling in his grave listening to this interview today. Glad you had and Emma pushed back on Judas's many xenophobic lies and historical inaccuracies. Uh, Chris from Taiwan. So your interview guest is an old lefty from way back. That makes sense, I guess. Peachy Keen, MR Crew. What are some good fiction reading recommendations you have? Fantasy football doesn't count, Emma. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you like fantasy books, uh, I the King Killer Chronicles. I feel like more people should be reading that. 
I haven't read a decent, I haven't read fiction in over a year and a half. Thomas Pynchon. Huh? Read Thomas Pynchon. Yeah. Thomas Pynchon is Matt and I are good big on. Um, I enjoyed the book Cherry by uh, Nico Walker as a good sort of like millennial account of the war in Iraq and the opioid crisis. However, it is definitely a depressing book. I heard the movie was bad, but the book was great. Me too. Yeah. All right, I, I'll, I'll give a couple of way backers. Um, uh, Flag for Sunrise, Robert Stone. Good book. Oh, I uh, want... Oh, God. John Barth. Um, Barth is Barth is sick. End of the road. Have I ever told that story about the uh, how I um, read that book? No. It's Do you want story. you want to tell it now? No, not right now. Am I? Oh right. Oh yeah. We got to go. Okay. I'm sorry. No Olympics. You said it one time. It's the first time I've gone over. Uh, the head of finance of Japanese Olympics committee just committed suicide this week. Oh God. As the opening ceremony in Tokyo approaches, the contradictions are coming to a head. A substantial growing majority of Japanese citizens want the games either postponed or canceled outright. Can you get Professor Jules Boykoff on to discuss? Um, Brendan, write that down. Jules Boykoff, K-O-F-F. -F. Yeah, we should write it. We should talk about that. Jonathan Armstead, the Nevada Family Alliance is calling for teachers to wear body cameras so that parents can monitor if their children are being taught critical race theory what oh my god oh my god chowder with crowder just want to say y'all pulled me out of the alt-right pipeline too what got me into the first place i'm ashamed to say was a loyal rogan listener for a long time and when all these figures would go on they would always seem reasonable and persecuted by frivolous people michael's battery of sam harris was the first exposure to mr and really disillusioned me about the intellectual uh, intellectual credibility of the people he was boasting on a show. I also want to say that if he could successfully define the working class as a muscular, hunky man, Crowder might become a leftist. And two more of these. <laughs> Echo Park tax. Uh, Louis Gome had his thinking in 1978 Superman where he flies around the earth backwards and goes backwards in time. Yes. And the final I am of the day. Sherman Nation, he's simply describing racism with extra steps. Emma, Matt, Brendan, good job today. Thanks, guys. Sorry, Emma. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid 